In a place the map forgot, a family guarded its blood like treasure. For seven generations, they married only themselves, fathers to daughters, brothers to sisters, cousins to cousins. What they believed was purity became a sentence. Bodies twisted, faces reshaped, voices slurred into something not quite human. No strangers ever crossed their threshold. No truth ever left their valley. Until now. This is the most deformed family ever recorded. And the horror was not born in one night. It was built, one marriage at a time. The wind moves slowly through the hollow, as if even the air has grown cautious here. At the far end of a rutted track, a road that seems to lose its nerve halfway to the horizon, sits a house without welcome. The roof line sags under decades of rain, the siding gray as bone. Every board carries the smell of damp wood, of summers gone sour. This is where they have always been, and where they have always stayed. Seven generations. That is how long their blood has circled back on itself, as though the family were an old river cut off from the current, swirling in its own stagnant pool. Fathers to daughters, brothers to sisters, cousins to cousins. The names repeat on gravestones in the churchyard like a litany. The same given names, the same surnames, carved and recarved, the dates crawling forward, but never far enough to escape each other. In this place, marriage is not a choice, but a tightening of a rope. Each knot is tied within reach. Each union locks the door a little more firmly against the outside. They called it keeping the line strong. They called it keeping out the strangers who would laugh or judge. But as the years turned, the children born of those vows began to carry the proof of their secrecy in their bodies. A boy born with a jaw too narrow to chew without pain. A girl whose spine bowed as she grew, her head forever tilted, as if listening to a voice no one else could hear. A generation where nearly every child spoke in a broken rhythm, their words dragging as though pulled through mud. The family learned to speak to each other in fragments, in gestures, in glances, language built for survival inside a circle. The first time an outsider stumbled upon them, it was by accident, a traveler who had lost the road and followed the sound of a bell. He would later say the bell was strange, as if rung by someone who had never heard a true church bell before. When he came to the yard, the family stood watching him from the porch, not smiling, not moving. Their eyes were pale, their skin weathered in uneven patches, as though light had never touched them the same way twice. He left quickly, and the word spread slowly, as it does in places where gossip is almost a kind of currency. But the valley had long ago decided to look the other way. No one came here for help. No one came here for company. And in the quiet, the family circle turned again and again. Inside the house, the room smelled of boiled vegetables, wood smoke, and the sharp tang of unwashed wool. The wallpaper had peeled into long, curling tongues. A crucifix hung over the hearth, but as Christ had been worn smooth by generations of touch, his face erased by the need for comfort. Children played in the yard without shoes, their toes splayed wide, their gait uneven. Laughter came in bursts, high-pitched, stuttering, ending abruptly as if someone had pressed a hand over it. And always, in the doorway, an elder would stand watching. The eldest always watched. At night, oil lamps painted the walls in trembling gold. The family gathered at the long table, their heads bent close. The air would be filled with the sounds of chewing, of swallowing, of the occasional murmur that rose and fell like the rustle of leaves. And in that light, the resemblance between them was unmistakable, the same set of the eyes, the same curve of the cheekbone, the same jut of the chin. Like variations of the same face, repeated over and over, slightly altered, slightly worn. Outside, the world moved forward, new roads laid, new towns built, Strangers passing in cars, with radios playing songs this family would never hear. But here, 
time folded in on itself. The same births, the same deaths, the same vows whispered under the same leaky roof. They say curses are stories given form. If that is true, then this curse was written in their very bones. And each generation carried it without question, until the bodies could no longer carry it at all. By the seventh generation, the bloodline was no longer simply marked. It was collapsing under its own weight. The features that had once been subtle quirks of resemblance became undeniable deformities. Cheekbones jutted too sharply, or not at all. Eyes set wide apart in one child would be sunken and narrow in his sister. The jawbone warped, twisting smiles into something involuntary, unsteady. Limbs did not match, one arm longer than the other, knees bowing inward or outward so severely that walking became an unsteady lurch. Speech, when it came, was not the language of the towns beyond the ridge. It was a tangle of syllables and guttural sounds, a rhythm broken into short bursts, punctuated by long, heavy silences. To each other, these voices were familiar, intimate even. But to an outsider, it was the sound of something both human and not. It was in this generation that outsiders came with cameras. They had heard the rumors, whispered by hunters, muttered by men in roadside diners, of a family untouched by new blood for over a century. The outsiders expected reluctance, even hostility. What they found was worse. The family did not hide. They stood in the yard as the visitors approached, silent, eyes following every movement, not curious, not afraid, only watchful. The camera's lens caught everything the valley had kept hidden. Fingers curled permanently into claws from joints grown rigid. Heads that bobbed or tilted without control. Eyes blinking in slow, uneven patterns, as though the signal to open and close traveled down a frayed wire. Skin pale as candle wax, patched with redness where the cold had bitten deep. Inside, the walls bore the damp stains of decades. The floorboards dipped and swelled, warping from the slow drip of rain through the roof. The smell was heavy, a mixture of boiled cabbage, kerosene, and the sour tang of unwashed bedding. In the corner, a small child sat rocking, a frayed piece of string twined endlessly between his fingers. His eyes flickered toward the visitors only once, and then never again. The patriarch, if such a word could still be used, sat at the table, a heavy coat draped over his shoulders despite the heat. His head trembled slightly, but his gaze was fixed and sharp. His voice, when it came, was a low murmur in a dialect no one outside the family could fully understand. Beside him, a woman stirred a pot over the stove, her lips moving silently, repeating something over and over, a prayer or a list, the words Subscribe to my catch. tunnel. The visitors asked questions, their tones careful, almost reverent, but there were no explanations. Only gestures, a pointed finger toward a chair, a wave toward the door, a sudden sharp shake of the head. The family did not try to justify itself. Justification would have required shame, and shame would have required comparison to another way of living. There was no other way here. Children emerged from the shadows as the sun lowered, their shapes framed in the doorway, thin bodies, large eyes reflecting the orange light. Some stared openly. Others shifted from foot to foot, hands twisting in the hems of their shirts. In the fading light, the repetition of features became overwhelming. The same eyes mirrored back again and again as if a single face had been broken into pieces and reassembled in different arrangements across the generations. The visitors stayed long enough to gather their images, their notes, their whispered observations. As they left, the family remained standing in the yard, watching the cars disappear into the dust. Not waving, not speaking, just watching until the dust settled and the hollow was quiet again. But something had shifted. The lens had broken the circle. Now, somewhere beyond the ridge, 
People who had never set foot in this valley knew of their existence, knew their faces, knew the shapes their blood had made. And though the family went back to their routines, the cooking, the watching, the slow turning of seasons, the shadow of that knowledge settled into the house like a cold draft. Generations had passed in secrecy, their story carried only in the bones of their children. But the seventh had been seen, and once seen, there could be no return to being only a whisper in the hills. In the stillness that followed, the house seemed to listen. For what, no one could say. Perhaps for the sound of tires returning. Perhaps for silence to grow so deep that the memory of those cameras would finally fade. But in the hearts of the elders, there was a quiet knowing that the story of this family, the most deformed line ever recorded, had begun to leave them. And once a story leaves its home, it does not come back the same. Seven generations had locked the door to the world. Now, the door stands open, and what has stepped out is not just their faces, but the memory of what blood can do when it is left to turn in on itself. The child looks toward the open road. The stone slips from his hand. Darkness.